This is the BYD Atto 3, and before we get to the review, I want to show you something inside the cabin. Check out this huge central screen, and this is its party piece. It rotates, how cool is that? Look at these funky air vents. Look at this shifter, it's like a barbell in a gym. It's really interesting in here. Hey, Alex here, and this is the BYD Atto 3. It's a brand new electric SUV, and there is so much talk about this thing right now for two key reasons. The first is price. It starts at just over $44,000. So depending on your state or territory, that makes it one of, if not the cheapest electric car you can buy in Australia right now. The second reason is that BYD is a brand new player to the Aussie market. And thanks to some conflicting information and a bit of a drip feed of information, we don't actually know that much about its Aussie operation just yet. We have had a quick go in a left-hand drive China market version of this car, but this is the production ready version with the steering wheel on the right. So in this review, I'm gonna go into as much detail as I can and also share as much new information as I can, but also answer the key question that I wanna know. Does the Addo 3's low entry price make it something of a bargain or does it drive and feel on the cheap side? Let's get to it. Okay, let's start with the biggest issue facing EVs in Australia right now, and that is they are expensive. Yes, sales are growing, and there are now some incentives out there, but you still need to fork out a lot of cash to get into one. Now though, it feels like we've reached something of a tipping point with more affordable models joining the market. The BYD Atto 3, for example, is currently locked in an arm wrestle with the MG ZS for the title of Australia's cheapest EV. The prices change a little bit depending on your state or territory and drive away deals, but both cars are around 45 grand drive away. In the BYD's case, that gets you one highly specced variant that has loads of space in equipment and the choice of two battery sizes. The standard car has a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack and starts at $44,381, but this car is the extended version, which has a 60 kilowatt hour battery and costs three grand more, so $47,381 before on roads. The Auto 3 is front wheel drive. It's powered by something called a blade battery, which sounds really cool. We'll get into more detail about that a little bit later when we take it for a drive. And it has a claimed WLTP range of 345 Ks for the smaller battery version, 420 Ks for the larger battery, which we are driving today. It's a rival for the MG ZS EV, which we spoke about before, but also the Kia Niro, Nissan Leaf, and Hyundai Kona EV. And it does measure up favorably for range, performance, and also recharging times. I'm gonna throw up a quick table on screen right now, so if you wanna see exactly how the Atto 3 measures up, hit pause about now. The rest of the exterior design is stylish and clean without being too adventurous or controversial and that is the exact opposite of what's going on inside the cabin but we'll get to that in a little bit. You score LED lights as standard, the front grille has BYD badging here and the mirrors are heated and retractable. Alloys, they're 18 inches no matter which version, which battery size you go for. I personally, not a huge fan of the design of the alloy but looks are subjective. One thing that is not up for debate though is the quality of the tyre that comes as standard. They are Atlas Batman A51s. I've never heard of those before, so I would be swapping those over for a higher quality piece of rubber as soon as you can. Other pieces of standard equipment, roof racks, every version gets that. Also a panoramic sunroof and the charging point is here on the right hand side of the car, just ahead of the driver's door. An AC power cable comes with the car, and from a 7 kilowatt hour wall box, it'll take you around 12 hours to get a full battery of charge. You can bump the AC charging up to 11 kilowatt hours if you have a three phase socket, and that drops charge times by around half, or you can go even faster on DC charging. On DC charging, BYD says you can achieve a full charge in around 50 minutes. Rewind to the table we showed earlier in the video if you want a refresher on how those times compare with the BYD's key competitors. Around the back there's this flash of silver here with a bit of a texture through it on the C-pillar. That reminds me of a Peugeot design feature. I don't know, do you guys think so? Let me know in the comments below. 
You also get a full width light bar across the tailgate, which I like, and there are rear parking sensors. Plus the boot is an electric tailgate. Officially, BYD says the boot space is measured at 440 litres with the rear seats up, and that expands to 1340 litres with the rear seats down. We actually have an MG ZS EV here today, so keep your eyes peeled for that comparison test on whichcar.com.au. But here's how much stuff we could fit in the BYD's boot compared with the MG's. In fact, in pretty much every dimension, the BYD is larger than its rivals, and that translates into more interior space, mostly because it has a bigger wheelbase. Here's exactly how it compares with its competitors for size. One quick thing I want to point out before we jump inside the cabin is I've just noticed this in the boot. Looks pretty shonky, like a regular double adapter thing you plug into your socket at home, but on the other end is this, and when you plug this into the Addo 3, you basically turn it into a huge battery, so you can charge all sorts of things from here. It's a vehicle to load capability. That's actually a useful feature, particularly if you're down on battery, you want to charge your phone, you're out on a campsite or something, need to crack some work on your laptop, it's got your back. If the exterior design is clean and simple, then the cabin is the exact opposite. There is so much going on in here, I don't really know where to begin. I guess an obvious place is probably the cabin's key feature, which is this huge 12.8 inch central touchscreen, which look, rotates. Now you could call that a little gimmicky. I don't think so because I personally, I like a portrait orientation for my central infotainment screen, but I also have heaps of friends that prefer it in a landscape. So I think it's kind of nice that BYD gives you the option. The screen itself is actually pretty impressive. It feels kind of like a generic tablet that you can buy from any electronic shop, but the graphics are really good. The resolution is nice and high, and it's quick to respond to your finger commands as well. Connectivity wise, no Apple CarPlay or Android Auto just yet, but BYD says they will be added later via an over the air update. There's no native sat nav either. So the screen itself is very big, very impressive, but functionality and feature wise, probably not as jam packed as it could be just yet, but hopefully that changes in the future. As for the rest of the cabin, look, I know that design and aesthetics are very subjective, but for me, the, the verdict is still out on exactly whether this is a cohesive and convincing cabin design. The inspiration is said to have been fitness culture or, you know, the gym and treadmills and things like that. And I can kind of see what they were going for. This kind of bulging section here below the central screen kind of looks like a bicep. You know, the air vents here are said to have been inspired by barbells that you get at the gym. That theme continues here with the kind of chunky shifter on the central console. I kind of like it. It's a bit funny. It's a bit, it has a bit of personality, which is something you don't have in a lot of modern cars these days. Materials quality is also higher than I was expecting. I don't know if this is actual real leather here on the seat or some kind of artificial material. It doesn't really matter because it feels nice and soft to touch. One thing that is a little bit weird is the material that's chosen for the center section of the dash here. Kind of feels like recycled wetsuit, and it does feel like it's gonna last longer than humanity itself, so I don't know about that one, but general ambience is pretty impressive. As for functionality, it's actually pretty good. The seats are comfortable, there's electric adjustment for the driver and the passenger, and again, the driving position is pretty good, even if you have a tall frame like me. Weirdly though, given how huge the central screen is, the digital driver display is on the small side. It's only about five inches big, but at least the graphics and the readouts are pretty big and nice and easy to read. Storage in the cabin is also pretty impressive, certainly more impressive than you get in an MG ZS EV. Look at the size of this central bin here. My whole arm basically disappears down in there. You have another huge storage cubby underneath the center console itself. There are thoughtful little touches as well, like this sort of removable section in the really deep central cup holders here. So you can have a coffee in there, it's not gonna disappear, but you can also put huge, really long water bottles in there as well. They'll swallow them, no problem. The door bins with their sort of guitar string feature, Look, they're not as roomy as some other cars at this price point. You're not gonna fit as much in there, but the rest of the cabin is absolutely bang on from a storage point of view. Really big glove box as well. 
I think the cabin design might polarize a few people, but if you judge this cabin purely on the amount of equipment, space, and storage you get at this price point, it is pretty impressive. Things are slightly less full on here in the back seat, but one feature I forgot to point out in the front is the door handle design, which look at this, that's kind of cool as well. Again, the sort of dumbbell theme continues here in the back there, and also again on the rear air vents. I was a bit dubious about this design to begin with, but now I'm kind of into it. I think it's a bit fun. Plus the fact that you get rear air vents in itself is a big bonus, especially if you're going to have kids back here. Speaking of kiddies, you get isofix mounting points on both of the outboard seats. There are even isofix points here on the front seat too, though I don't think you can put them up there legally in Australia at least. The rest of the safety package for this car is pretty impressive. I'm gonna put up a table now of all the standard active and passive safety gear that you get. It's the same across both models. As for space and comfort back here, again, it's pretty impressive. There's really not that much to pick on. Because this car has a bigger wheelbase than most of its competitors, look at the amount of knee room that I have. That is my seating position. I'm six foot two, so you can easily put tall adults behind other tall adults, no problem at all. Kids are gonna be no drama. Plus, because this is built on a dedicated EV platform, there's no clumsy transmission tunnel to navigate or trip over if you're gonna have a third person in here. The seat itself is very comfortable. The cushion is low, it's nice and deep set. I'm lacking a little bit of under thigh support, but I do have very long legs. And again, storage hasn't been forgotten about either. Both seats have map pockets and other little pockets here that you can put your phone in, no drama at all. Door bins continue, as do the guitar strings. I don't know how much fun that's gonna be when you've got a toddler back here strumming away for four hours straight, but I think you can remove those quite easily. Central armrest, again, with two cup holders there. I think from an interior point of view, this cabin might be quite flashy, lots of personality, but it hasn't forgotten the basics either. All right, last time we drove the Addo 3 a few months ago, it was a China-specific car and the steering wheel was on the other side of the car. So, now that we are in the Australian production version, what's changed? Well, apart from me sitting on the other side of the car, not a whole lot. Uh, when it was first announced BYD was coming to Australia, the Aussie importer did say that we would get an Aussie-specific tune for our roads and also that the car would be shod with continental tyres. Now, to keep production moving as quickly as possible, neither of those things have transpired. So, in terms of chassis tune, it's pretty soft. It's basically the same thing that you get in China, I think. Still, initial thoughts, I've only been driving the car for a little while today. A full road test will um, happen once we spend a bit more time in the car. But, first impressions are that two things have really surprised me. The first one is, Dynamically, it's more together than I was anticipating it to be. Yeah, the chassis is quite softly set up, so the suspension has quite a lot of travel to it. It's quite wafty. There's quite a long wheelbase here as well, so the car feels a little bit lazy to change direction. The steering is also quite light in normal mode, which we are in right now. There's also eco and sport to contend with. but. It doesn't feel like it's going to fall over in any corners. There aren't any nasty surprises when you crank on some steering lock quite quickly like that. One thing that is annoying is that the active safety systems like that sometimes get false positives. We've had that a few times today. We were just driving along a very straight, normal piece of road and we get an annoying little chime like that. So maybe some calibration issues around the active safety systems. But dynamically, I'm pretty impressed so far. Steering is pretty light and lifeless as most modern electronic steering systems are, but it's accurate and it's completely fine. Is this the last word in dynamics? Is it gonna blow you away if you're a keen driver? No. Is it gonna fall over? Do you gonna have any major issues when you drive the car? No, it is perfectly fine for a city car and the occasional trip outside of the city as well. All right, consumer car advice here, turning circle. On a BYD Auto 3, mm, not amazing, but...
full throttle. Oh, we had a massive wheel spin moment on a slightly wet piece of road. That was slightly alarming. The old Batman tires proving that you should change them as soon as you can. <laughs> Another thing to talk about is the brake pedal and the regen braking because this car does have regen braking, although not that you can really tell. We've got two stages for the regen braking, which you activate with this switch on the center console. There's normal, and there's standard, sorry, and then there's high. But even in high, that's me lifting off the throttle there. It's virtually non-existent. So that feels like a little bit of a missed opportunity. There's certainly not enough regen for one pedal braking or one pedal driving or anything like that. The rest of the ride and handling it certainly feels its weight. It kind of feels a little bit heavy footed. It weighs about 1700 kilos and that's heavier than most of the cars in this segment. Plus it feels a little bit bigger. So it's certainly not what I would call agile when you start to sort of throw it around a little bit. Um, it's not going to tickle your fancy if you're a keen driver, let's just put it that way. But it's not really going to disappoint you either if you're going to spend most of your time driving around the city and the occasional jaunt into the country. The second thing that has surprised me about how the Auto 3 drives, and not in a good way, is the level of performance on offer. So officially, this car has 150 kilowatts and 310 newton meters. BYD also says it goes from 0 to 100 in 7.3 seconds, but when you pull away from the lights or a stop sign like this, I'll show you, that is full throttle, it doesn't have the immediacy or the step off acceleration that you have in most electric cars. The throttle pedal is actually surprisingly soggy, especially in sort of low speed maneuvers. Once you're up and moving around, it has got enough performance to kind of push you back in the seat. But I don't know if it's a calibration issue to deal with the pretty crappy rubber that's fitted as standard, but I don't know, seat of the pants, I don't think this car has as much power and performance as BYD says it does on paper. Where the lack of power and also the terrible tires come into their own is a corner like this. Very sharp. <laughs> so we're getting lots of tire squeal, scrabbling for traction. Thank you, active safety system. We are not about to have a head-on collision. So, scrabbling for traction, lots of tire squeal, and actually we're not going that quickly because there's not that much power to put down. A Couple of other observations worth mentioning are rear three-quarter vision, not amazing. So it's got a pretty chunky C-pillar on this car and looking over your shoulder to check your blind spot is a bit of an issue. Happily, we have blind spot detection as standard, but if you want to use your eyes, if you're old school like me and you want to sort of turn over your shoulder whenever you're changing lanes, vision out, not so great. One thing that is excellent is the resolution of the reversing, oh, that system. One thing that is excellent is the resolution of the reversing camera and the 360 degree monitor. Used it a few times today in really tight car parks and found it really super useful. Right, time to talk about the battery. Powering the electric motor is BYD's hugely hyped blade battery. And that's different from the traditional lithium ion batteries in most EVs. We went into loads of detail about the Blade battery in our other BYD review, so we'll put a link to that at the top of the screen now, but the headline differences are it uses a slightly different chemical makeup and it's made of a series of long and really thin blades that have a positive and a negative terminal at either end. It's cheaper to make because it doesn't have as many rare materials and it's also said to be safer in an accident if the battery pack is pierced. So while all of that sounds fantastic in theory, in practice, the BYD Auto 3 drives exactly like most other electric cars, albeit one with a slightly soft chassis tune, pretty rubbish tyres and maybe not as much initial step off acceleration as you might be imagining. Is this car going to tickle your fancy if you're a keen driver? Probably not. Is it better to drive than I was expecting? Yeah, absolutely. Right, this bit is important. It's probably the biggest question mark you might have if you're considering buying one of these cars right now. BYD is a new brand, doesn't have any official dealers just yet. Plus, it's already backtracked on a few of its initial claims around the warranty and the tow rating of this vehicle. So I can forgive you if you're feeling a little bit nervous around the kind of customer support you might get if you buy one of these. Firstly, BYD's model is online only. 
nothing new or scary about that, and you simply go onto the website and order your car online. Current wait times are around six months, with BYD forecasting an early 2023 arrival if you ordered your car now. Still, there are no official dealers, at least for now, and servicing is handled through either Eager's Automotive Dealers or through select My Car service centres, which used to be Kmart Tire and Auto. BYD says there are already around 50 My Car sites available across the country, and that number is going to grow pretty soon. There are two cap price servicing plans. A standard kilometre plan requires you to go to the dealer every 12 months or 20,000 Ks, and it includes eight years of coverage, which averages the servicing costs out to around $299 per visit. A low kilometre version is also available, and if you can keep your BYD below 12,000 Ks a year, services average out to be around $189 per visit. Now, the warranty. This is a big one because the Atto 3's reliability and its quality is a bit of an unknown. Initially, BYD said it would come with a seven-year unlimited kilometre warranty, which was exactly the same as you got in an MG ZS EV. But they've now wound that back. So the car itself has a six-year 150,000K warranty, but the battery has an eight-year 160,000km warranty. Unusually though, BYD's Aussie importer has also listed different warranties for different components on the car. Some elements of the suspension and the infotainment system, for example, are only covered for three years or 60,000 Ks. It's all a bit weird, it's quite detailed. We have a full video on the warranty of this car, which I'll put a link to up there. So if you're interested, go and give that a watch. One final thing to mention before we move on is that if you buy one of these cars, you also score complimentary 12 months of roadside assistance. So there you go, that is a detailed look at the BYD Atto 3. And to answer my question at the beginning of the video, no, cheap certainly doesn't mean nasty in this regard. Certainly not perfect though, and BYD still has a way to go to prove itself from a reliability and a customer service perspective, but for its price, there is a lot to like about the Atto 3. Right now, wait times are around six months. And if you've ordered an Atto 3, jump into the comments and let me know. I also want to know about your favorite features from inside the cabin. There are certainly lots to choose from. And if you have any questions that I haven't answered, fire away. I'll jump into the comments and try to answer them as best I can. Finally, make sure you keep an eye out for our comparison test between this car and the MG ZS EV. I get the sense that the result of that comparo is going to be quite interesting.